You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Heiser's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 203, our 24th Q&A. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's a scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how you doing this week? Pretty good, pretty good. It's been a good week, productive, interesting. So, yep, glad to be here and go through some more questions. All right, Mike. Well, it's been a while since we've done a regular Q&A. Um, I apologize for everybody out there um, if I don't respond to your emails. I get so many emails now that I kind of get behind and it's hard to keep up. But please know I do see y'all's emails and I do put your questions in the queue. So keep sending me those questions if you have any. I promise you eventually we'll get to them, hopefully. Um, and yeah, uh, Some of the longer ones turn into whole episodes. Some of the episodes that are coming have come from questions. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, should we just get right into these? We've got five sure. questions today. And uh, our first one is going to be from Rick. And he wants to know what changed between the Old Testament giving and the New Testament giving. Yeah, well, that's yeah, that's a that's an important question, also a pr- pretty variegated question. I mean, the short answer is the uh, the theocracy went away. <laughs> I think that's probably the easiest place to start. I mean, it, on, on my website, I think for anybody who's listening and interested in the subject of giving and tithing, if you go to drmsh dot com and put in the word tithing, that's T I. T H I N G. You're going to get to a blog post where I have links to a two part article series uh, on tithing that I think is really well done. So that would give you the the details of what I'm going to what I'm going to say here. Um, not the two articles aren't things that I've written, but I they're written by somebody else. I just think it covers really all the bases and does a good job of it. You know, once you have the the theocracy gone. That affects a lot because the tithing system of the Old Testament was meant to maintain the priesthood of this, this whole theocratic system that we think of as ancient Israel. You know, when the temple goes out, I was going to say out the window, but when the temple you know burns down, you know, it, it, it's gone. And now there's still a priesthood around, but there were certain parts of the tithing system that were linked to certain things you did in the temple. Okay, that that's going to naturally change things. Um, you know, when the temple was rebuilt, I mean, it's not quite what it was in, in Solomon's day. You don't have political independence. You don't have political autonomy uh, like you did under the days of, of you know David and Solomon. A lot of the Old Testament laws about tithing certain resources, you know, just went with a certain lifestyle, a certain way of life that was geared to having a country, having that country run from a city, having a monarchy, having a temple. All of that gets gets shuffled and changed, you know, with the loss of a temple, the loss of a theocratic way of life. Now, you still have, you know, people in synagogues, like in after the temple is destroyed, you have the synagogue system develop. You had people teaching in the synagogues, and, and they— you know, could still expect, I think, both culturally and and scripturally, um, that the idea of supporting those kinds of people, especially if they they are still in the role of a priest, even though what they do now is is somewhat limited. Again, in the absence of a temple um, or the same you know kind of uh, system and setup, they they still you know have the right to be uh, supported and maintained. You know, this is the way it was just generally in the ancient Near East. This is how priests lived their livelihood came from contributions you know sacrifices maybe contributions of land or you know physical goods metals whatever you know this is this is how they live now in the new testament era again when the the whole people of god moves away from having an an ethnic identity and a theocratic identity so to now we're including you know gentiles in, in the very fabric of the people of God. In in the New Testament era, according to what the New Testament says, everybody's a priest, priesthood of the believer. So by definition, that just doesn't conform, you know, to the Old Testament system. 
And this is in part why you don't have a carryover in the New Testament of of the the tithing language or the system of the Old Testament. Now, Paul, though, taught that he had the right to this kind of support as a servant of God. I mean, he didn't he didn't take it. He decided, you know, to do, you know, do tent making, you know, to support himself. But he does remind, you know, readers like in the epistles to the Corinthians that he as an apostle, he could have demanded, you know, this sort of thing and would have had, you know, ground to stand on, so to speak. But he doesn't do that. Again, that's in place, even though it's not a priestly model so much like the Israelite culture, the Israelite system, what we we read in the Hebrew Bible, you know, that there's just this presupposition that servants of God just generally should be supported by the believing community. If you think about the Old Testament, there is this sort of system of support outside the direct theocratic monarchical sort of situation. The prophets, for instance, okay, there, there, there's no like you're not, you're not going to read in the in the Torah about specific tithes going to prophets. The prophets were something different. They, you know, they were people raised up during the days of the monarchy, the united monarchy, the divided monarchy, again to you know God raising up essentially covenant enforcers. That's what prophets were. They would preach to people about being loyal to God, loyal to the covenant, and all that sort of thing. Well, those those people. Just culturally, it was assumed that they, you know, somebody's going to support them. You know, Elijah, you know, had the situation with the widow and the room and board, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Th- there were people in the community that would contribute to recognized individuals that were considered to speak for God. And, and that, that's kind of what Paul's drawing on as well. Um, you had Isaiah, who was sort of a prophet of the, of the royal court. You know, he, that was a little bit different. He's probably getting some support from the monarchy itself, you know, at that point. But there's what I'm pointing to is there's just this assumption in Scripture and by example, the the legitimizing of the assumption that servants of God should be supported by the community. So broadly speaking, that's intact, even if the theocratic, you know, tithing system is not, even though that doesn't survive from Old and New Testament, the general idea does. Uh, this gets muddied a little bit in the New Testament because there, in the New Testament, all the passages that that pastors like to use to convince people that they should be tithing. If you actually look at those passages, it's let's just use you know what happens in the Book of Acts and Paul. Paul is going around collecting money for the saints in Jerusalem. Okay, you, you don't you don't actually have this this weekly giving system. For individual churches, Paul doesn't go into a church and, and, and start preaching tithing for that church. Wherever he goes, apparently, because he brings it up a lot, there's this notion of, hey, you know, you sister churches here that I'm starting and that I, I started or that I'm, I'm, I'm in your presence now, you know, all of this, the gospel, you know, started back with, the, with Jesus and the disciples. And there's this Jerusalem church that's notoriously poor they're under persecution all the time, and it's pretty big, so that kind of compounds the problem. You know, he he takes up collections for them, for a, an altogether different church, and that's actually what you see described uh, in in the New Testament. You don't have a new tithing system for individual local churches laid out. You have this general assumption that the laborer is worthy of his hire, but then the actual giving passages are really for a, this one church back in Jerusalem. So you don't have a whole lot of scriptural structure for this. But what, what happens is, well, the Old Testament's in our Bible, and so we're going to preach tithing, even though that was Israel and the theocracy and the priesthood, even though we don't have that. And I, I, I mean, I understand that, but I, I think we're better off, and I think this is what the New Testament actually does, is it teaches the principle of giving. It teaches that the laborer is worthy of his hire, and you should give cheerfully, you should give sacrificially. It's not about a certain percentage. You you should contribute and give what you can, and you know what you can. You know what sacrificial is. You know what, you know you you know whether you're sort of not doing your part or whether you are. And and the New Testament leaves that up to the individual, but it lays down the principle of of cheerful giving, sacrificial giving, and the labor being worthy of his hire. It doesn't worry about strict percentages like we had in, in the theocratic system. So there really are no New Testament rules about tithing, but there are very clear principles about the Lord's servants being supported 
Uh, it's just that we don't have this strict percentage system layout uh, like we do in the Old Testament. Martin in Enid, Oklahoma, ask, was Yahweh's presence absent from the second temple because of the Ark of the Covenant was no longer present? Yeah, I think that is the conclusion we're supposed to draw. I mean, Ezekiel has the glory, you know, the, the presence of God departing uh, before Jerusalem and its temple are destroyed. Uh, again, we, we covered that in our series on Ezekiel. There's no evidence anybody thereafter uh, in the second temple period when they build, you know, they rebuild uh, the, the temple or they actually build, you know, a second temple. There's no evidence that anybody thought that the glory had returned. Uh, there's, there's no there's no passage that gives that indication. Interestingly enough, though, even though the, the, the question presupposes something that, that that's correct, you know, the God's presence is, is gone from the temple. Again, it, it's not, you know, just the ark. It's it's because of the apostasy. But the ark, you know, is, is gone and so on and so forth. The glory departs before Jerusalem, the temple are destroyed. Okay, that that's that's pretty self evident evident. But what's really interesting is that the New Testament takes this idea about the return of the glory. It actually takes certain passages that talk about the return of the glory, you know, seeing God in in Jerusalem again, and applies them to Jesus. Now, I'll just give you a few for instances here. In Ephesians 5.14, we read, For anything that becomes visible is light, therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. You say, well, what does that have to do with the temple? Well, it's actually a use, a repurposing of Isaiah 60, verses 1 and 2. Now listen to that. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. Okay, this is Isaiah 60. This is set in a post or an exilic and post-exilic era. So here you have a situation where the the future glory, you know, of God is is again going to be, you know, shining, you know, upon Jerusalem, upon Israel again. And Paul takes that and applies it to Jesus. Arise. Christ will shine on you. You, you, you just, you know, you have John the Baptist. John the Baptist is herald, he's the herald of the coming of the of the Messiah, but but there's actually glory language connected to the passages that the gospel uses or use to talk about the messenger that comes before the Messiah. Isaiah 40, verse 5, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. There's a reference to the glory, pretty explicit. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. You know, if you, if you go out to Isaiah 40, again, this is, you know, the crooked, you know, places will be made straight. And this is this messianic language. And Mark and other gospel writers quote Isaiah 40, verse 5, and other parts of Isaiah 40 to give context to John the Baptist being the herald from Isaiah 40, who is announcing the coming, the return of the Lord, the return of the glory. And that turns out to be Jesus in the Gospels. You know, you, you get a passage like Isaiah 66, verses 18 and uh, through 19, you know, that you get, you know, sort of a similar feel to this. It, verse 18 says, For I know their works and their thoughts, and the time is coming to gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and shall see my glory. And I will set a sign among them, and from them I will send survivors to the nations, to Tarshish, to Pol, to Lud who draw the bow to Tabal and Javan, to the coastlands far away that have not heard my fame or seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the nations. Now, think, look at the elements of that. The time is coming to gather all nations in tongues. They shall come and shall see my glory. And I'm going to set this sign among them, okay? And then they're going to, they're going to go from here. They're going, to, they're going to spread all over to these different nations, Tarshish, of course, ought to draw the interest of this audience. Uh, you know, Tubal, Javan, I mean, the, the, these are places mentioned in the Table of Nations, uh, so on and so forth, to the coastlands that are far away. Why? Why am I sending them out? Because they have not heard my fame or seen my glory, and I'm going to make sure that it's declared among the nations. If you look at that, 
And Paul, in a few of his epistles, draws on Isaiah 66, this passage, to talk about his own ministry. And then you look at what happens in Acts chapter 2 with the coming of the Spirit, when the nation, you know, people from the nations are gathered, they see, you know, the, this, this miracle of Pentecost, and then they go back to their nations and start, you know, spreading the word about the Messiah. You could actually make a good argument that the pouring out of the Spirit in Acts chapter 2 is the return of the glory. And, you know, it's not, it's not, it's different, but it's the same as Jesus, you know, this whole Jesus is, but isn't the spirit, you know, kind of thing. And, you know, that, that these events, let's just speak broadly, the, the coming of Messiah, you know, God incarnate, and then following his resurrection and ascension, the coming of the spirit in his place, that this is the return of the glory. I mean, it's very easy to draw that conclusion from the New Testament. So you don't need an ark. You don't even need a temple. Because in the New Testament, what, what's up with that? Well, we're the temple. You know, again, we, we've had the, the full episode we had, like on Ezekiel 40 through 48, the, the part two, we got into all this New Testament temple language. This is where the glory is now. Okay, you know, all, all this, this language about the glory in the temple, it's applied to believers and Jesus. Why, you know, again, why is that consistent? Because we are the body of Christ. I mean, the, the, these terms and these metaphors are used to point to these, these, you know, these, these spiritual items, these theological items, deliberately. Again, this is all theological messaging, uh, you know, repurposing the Old Testament. Dan wants to know if the third heaven, also called paradise a couple of lines later, is what we commonly think of as heaven. What are the first and second heavens? Yeah, it's actually it's actually all of the above. Um, you know, we have to remember when we get into this that heaven heaven doesn't have literal geography. There's no latitude and longitude. There's no literal levels or stages as though when you were in one you could measure their size or their distance from each other. Okay, so we got we have to be careful that we don't overly literalize the language when it talks about heaven or these levels of heaven and so on and so forth. I mean they're they're all this other place and they you know they're they're spoken of in, in these ways to distinguish parts of them. And again, we, we, we are forced to use the language of space. We are forced to use spatial language, the language of embodiment and physicality to talk about a spiritual realm that doesn't actually have those things because it's not the world of, of, of our experience and our embodiment. But the only way we can talk about those other things is to use the language of our experience and of our embodiment. This is just always the way it is uh, in, in Scripture and in our own discussions. So with, with that in mind, the levels language is trying to communicate that the presence of God, God himself, like, like where the presence is in the spiritual world, that that spot, as it were, and realize we can't even speak of God in that way correctly, because that makes God a spatial being. But God is omnipresent. Okay, you see the problem we have of even using this language, but I'm, I'm just going to try to wade through it because that's what we have to do. So the levels language is trying to communicate that the presence of God is the holiest place in the spiritual world. God occupies in Paul's language, the third level. Some, there are some ancient texts from the Second Temple period that have three levels of heaven. Second Corinthians 12, 2 is you know, what the, the question is really deriving from. Other texts have seven levels. You say, well, why is it different? You know what? Well, they're all talking, trying to communicate the same idea, that, that the highest level, the seventh level, or the third you know, level, is, the, the place where God is at, that's the holiest spot, the holiest place. The language tries to parse out where we are in the spiritual realm, where other objects are in the spiritual realm, and then where God himself is in the spiritual realm. And so it has to use this, this level language to do that, uh, again, to, to make sure that God is given the preeminent place. He is the preeminent being on, you know, in this, this plane of reality, the spiritual world. You know, again, it's just a way of establishing, to use a, a Levitical you know, way of expressing it, gradations of holiness. You know, if you think about the temple, the tabernacle and the temple, there were, the, 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 the more inward you went, the greater the sanctity, okay? So that you had 
you, you couldn't have non-priests occupy like the first level of, of sacred space. I mean, they could bring a sacrifice up to the to the to the gate or the door of the tabernacle, and it would be sacrificed. But they couldn't go beyond a certain point. Then priests could go there, but but you know there was a, there was a, a subset of those priests who could go into the holy place. And then there's there's only one priest that could actually go into the most holy place, the holy of holies, once a year. This was this was designed to to teach and to reinforce the idea that the ground gets holier, okay, the closer to God that you are. It's this, the, these gradations of holiness. We talked about this in Leviticus about, you know, what's done with the blood and, and all this kind of stuff and who can go where. It's the same idea sort of transferred into the spiritual realm when you get these levels of heaven. Um, there's a lot of speculation in Second Temple period literature. You get all these heavenly visions and journeys of individuals like Enoch and Abraham and Baruch and you know so on and so forth. There's, there's there's a number of Old Testament characters that have these journeys, and then and you get this language, you know, that as they're as they're on their trip, so to speak, to to see the presence of God, you pass through certain levels, these heavenly levels, and and it's designed again to teach the idea that the closer to God you get, the more sanctified the space is, the, the more holy it is. I I personally think the three level approach. Is probably modeled after the temple. You have the court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. You got three levels there. The seven levels again. I, again, my suspicion is that it has something to do with the number seven being perceived or thought about as perfection. Uh, and and you say, well, well, how do you get seven in perfection? Well, it's modeled after the creation week that everything is created in six days, and on the seventh day, God rests in his his temple, which is you know. In, in in Genesis, which is you know Eden on Earth, you know that that it it, it completes the activity. Uh, there, there, this is what what God wanted to do. He did, and He did it you know exactly the way He wanted to do it. So you've got this this perception, this this idea, this numerical tag, as it were, number seven, that speaks of completeness and and in that sense, a perfection. So I, I tend to think that that number is used again to convey the same idea, and I think that the number three you know, is we're speaking of levels, is really drawn more from uh, sacred space on the ground, you know, boots on the ground, so to speak, that we read about in the Old Testament. Our next question is from Daniel in Nicholasville, Kentucky, and he asks, does the Sethite worldview imply that one can be children of God by natural lineage? If so, is that the same error the Jews fell into when they boasted that they have Abraham as their father? Or as a negative example, Seth being the good seed and Cain being the bad seed, could we liken that to the extreme fundamentalist idea that a certain ethnic group having the mark of Cain are unredeemable? Yeah, it, it, it's kind of akin to all that. Um, you know, the, the Jews in the Gospels are basically claiming election by virtue of Abraham. You know, again, if you believed that Genesis 6, you know, was another manifestation of an elect line back to Adam. You know, if you, if you take the, the Sethite view, the human view only, you know, if you believe that, that this is about an elect line back to Adam, then, you'd, you know, you'd, you'd fall into the same kind of thinking. Of course, nothing says that any line was elect prior to God's creation of Israel by virtue of Abraham and Sarah. That's when you get, you know, you get this election language in the Torah, and it's always about, you know, Abraham and Sarah's descendants, you know, Israel. So it, that kind of thinking, though, can get transferred to other passages, and of course it does. Those who would say that the Jews descended from Cain, to, you know, to, to, to track on the negative example for a moment here, people who are going to say that kind of stuff, the Jews are descended from Cain and they're, and they're Satan's spawn, you know, th those kinds of people who are just, you know, whacked, um, they're going to be saying things like the line of Cain is unredeemable because, you know, they're linking it to this satanic idea, this sort of you know satanic genesis of, in their case, specifically Jews. Now, I, I don't know any fundamentalism. I'm, this isn't to say that there isn't one, but I haven't run into into one that would would have said blacks were unredeemable. Uh, I, I have certainly run into a few people where the mark of Cain was interpreted as skin color. I mean that you'll see, and and of course you'll read a, a lot about that. But even even people who thought that. They, you, you couldn't say that all of those people thought that, like the, the the Negro race, or you know, again to use our modern terminology, African Americans, that they were unredeemable. Some did, 
some did, but it really depended on whether those people thought, and this is actually, you know, 19th century kind of stuff, uh, even even earlier, seven, it just let's just say 18th, 19th century uh, kind of dialogue, wondering if the black race descended from Adam or from some other co-Adamic or pre-Adamic human. Uh, th- this kind of, again, biblical nonsense, and of course, biological nonsense, arises from this crisis uh, in these centuries of having to explain from the Bible, and, and that's in air quotes, explain from the Bible where these other races, these other humans that explorers are encountering, where they come from. Um, and, and, and the things like skin color get, get drawn into this conversation. Obviously, you know, people could visually observe differences in skin color and other physiological uh, differences, but it, all of that gets sort of drawn into the same odd and in some cases repugnant you know, conversation in these centuries. And there were certain who would have said, who would have landed on this idea that, oh, this race bears the mark of Cain, and then they're unredeemable. Or, oh, this race, you know, is, you know, bears the mark of Cain, but who cares? You know, we're, we're, we're not going to evangelize them or whatever. We're not, you know, either, either, well, they might be redeemable, but we're not going to waste our time. And they weren't all like that, though. Some, some, you know, came up with really goofy explanations for race, but they still were, were viewed ultimately as descending from Adam, you know, in, in some way. And so, it, it didn't deter evangelistic efforts. So it really depended on whether your quote unquote biblical racial theory, unquote, whether it had, you know, these alternate people groups linked to Adam in some way or not. If you if you if you thought they were not of the Adamic line, then by definition there would be groups that would say, Oh, they're non elect. They're just gonna go to hell, they're unredeemable, or we shouldn't we shouldn't give her up. You, you had that. You had that kind of thinking. I want to read. Uh, I, I this this question prompts me. I have this in in digital here, so it's real convenient. Um, a little part of Adam's ancestors um, that that this question just reminded me of. And uh, I've I've referenced this book before uh, on the podcast. If 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 any of you are interested in the harm that bad thinking about the Bible can do. <laughs> This is a must read. I mean, I, I in my library, I've collected most of the scholarly uh, books on bad exegesis that led to racial theory, and and this is one of the more important books. Uh, it's 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 informative, but obviously, when you think about the content, it can be tragic too. This is from page sixty five of Adam's Ancestors, and it's on the section of of, of that particular chapter that's labeled or, or subheaded. Human Origins and the Politics of Slavery. So here's a short excerpt. As early as 1680, the Church of England clergyman and missionary, first to Virginia and later Barbados, Morgan Godwin, wrote at length in support of the right of African slaves and Native Americans to be admitted to church membership in a tract for the times addressed to the Archbishop of Canterbury. Rather sanguine about the practice of slavery itself, he vigorously argued their case in his lengthy 1680 plea entitled The Negroes and Indians Advocate Suing for Their Admission into the Church. It's the end of the title. Godwin was fully aware that what he called the, quote, pre-Adamites whimsy, unquote, was being deployed first to, quote, derive our Negroes from a stock different from Adam's, unquote, and then to quote unquote, brutify them. His intention, by contrast, was to, again, quoting from the, the tract, to prove the Negroes' humanity, unquote. It was a strategy diametrically opposed to those Spaniards, and he seems to have had Sepulveda in mind, who had concluded that certain races were not human in order to justify their murdering the Americans, i.e. the Native Americans. For all that, he acknowledged that fantastic and false. These are all in quotes, empty and silly. And again, in other words, Godwin's not buying it. He acknowledged that fantastic, false, empty, and silly, all of that, though the foul heresy of pre-Adamism was its original author himself, 
had never used it to dehumanize any racial group, but rather had acknowledged the full humanity of the pre-Adamites. Now, that's the end of the selection. So here you have Godwin, the guy who wrote this, who acknowledged that, okay, there's this view out here of pre-Adamic races, and he was determined not to use it to dehumanize any group. You know, Negroes, and, and, and in his terms, Negroes and the Americans, which we, by, you know, we mean you know, the Native Americans, the, the latter reference there. So this is the kind of thinking. This is 17th century. You're going to get it 18th century. It's going to live into the 19th century. And really, you know, frankly, for those of us who are old enough, 20th century. But the, the, the use of the Bible to classify certain races in a certain way as being less than Adam or peripheral to Adam. And one of the strategies for doing that was this Mark of Cain idea. And, and, and that go, does go pretty well, hand in hand, with the Sethite theory. Now, of course, people who take the Sethite interpretation of Genesis 6, they're, they're not doing it so that they can go here. They can go to these wacky racial theories. Um, and, and even back then, they weren't necessarily you know, doing it. But, but you could take the Sethite view. And once you took the Sethite view of Genesis 6, you would go backward, and then you would quite literally, demonize the Cainite line, and you would insert the Sethite and Cainite, Cainite dichotomy into Genesis 6. So again, this is part of the Sethite thinking, Sethite view thinking. And, and all of that became fodder. It was, and it became fodder for racial theory. You could, you could get there from the Sethite view, but let, let's be clear, uh, people who take the Sethite view uh, over against the, the supernaturalist view of Genesis 6 they're not doing it to 99.9% .9 of the time to justify racism. But in the old days, you know, centuries ago, this is where a lot of that, that groundwork was laid. And so I think this is a, this is a, it's an interesting observation, you know, that the, the questioner has here, uh, Daniel. And yeah, you know, you, it, it's akin, it's akin, you know, to, to these other things, but we don't want to necessarily see a cause and effect uh, link to some of this awful stuff that uh, can really be laid at the feet of bad Bible interpretation. Neil has a two-part question. Does Mark yeah. 16, verse 9 through 20, deserve to be treated as scripture or just a footnote? And why is drinking poison and being bitten by snakes listed with things like healing, deliverance, and speaking in tongues as evidence of believers? Yeah, well, I, I, I'm. Let's be clear. I'm not a textual critic, so I'm going to have to, you know, look up, you know, some things to just introduce here as far as an answer to this question. I'm not a textual critic, uh, but I, I, I'll say that. But I'll also say this: I've never seen a good defense of the longer ending of Mark, that is, verses nine through twenty, and and for that reason, I'm, I'm in the camp, which most, I don't, I don't want to say all, but certainly most textual critics. I'm in, I'm in the camp with them that does not think verses 9 through 20 are authentic. Uh, the only reason it really matters is because of what the question alluded to, that you have snake handling preachers living in different parts of the world, parts of the country. They've made use of this, this material, and they've died or been responsible for somebody else's death. You know, so it, it, yeah, it, it does matter uh, in, in that respect. But again, I, I'm in the camp that really can't find a good defense of the authenticity of verses 9 through 20 when it comes to Mark uh, 16. Now, by way of textual evidence uh, for the longer ending of Mark, again, verses 9 through 20, which is pretty weak, I'm going to read a little excerpt from Omenson's book. This is from uh, Omenson and, and Bruce Metzger, A Textual Guide to the Greek New Testament. And this is an adaptation of Metzger's textual commentary uh, on the Greek New Testament. So they write this. They have several manuscripts, including four Greek unseal manuscripts of the 7th, 8th, and 9th centuries A.D. continue after verse 8 as follows, with a few small variations. And here's, here's the, 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 the verse. But they reported briefly to Peter and those with him and all that had been told. And after these things, Jesus himself went out through them from east to west, the sacred and imperishable proclamation, 
of eternal salvation. Amen. So you have four manuscripts, what this amounts to, four manuscripts from the 7th, 8th, and 9th centuries. So this is 700 to 900 years after the days of the apostles. Okay? That after verse 8, they add that little statement that I just read. Okay, and then that's where, in those manuscripts, that's where Mark ends. It ends with what we have as verse 8, and then this little addendum. Now, all of the manuscripts that have this reading, okay, except for one old Latin manuscript, continue with verses 9 through 20. Now, what that means is that the longer ending of Mark, verses 9 through 20, this is the best manuscript support for it, 7th, 8th, 9th century AD. Stuff that's older is not going to have, they're not going to have the verses in it. So here you are in the, in the New Testament textual, text critical debate about, you know, priority manuscripts, the older manuscripts, you know, do, does it, if they're older, you know, should they be counted as, as better and, and all that kind of stuff. We did a whole episode on this, but you don't really have very strong evidence for the longer ending of Mark. It's, it's centuries, you know, seventh century is, is what you're dealing with here. Uh, a second source, R.T. France, in his commentary, uh, on on Mark says this. This is a little bit longer, and I, I like France's uh, commentaries. He's done a couple of them. He's, I just like them. He's pretty good. He writes a number of later minuscule manuscripts, and these are these are medieval and be, and beyond. Give the longer ending, but mark it off with marginal signs or comments to indicate that its textual status is doubtful. So even the scribes themselves are, are making little notes uh, in what they're copying. They're faithfully copying the longer ending, but they're, they're putting these little marks in there. The 5th century Codex W, one of the earliest manuscripts to have the longer ending. So now you get, you know, in our, in our text stuff, now you, you move back to the 5th century. You know, it's one of the few, one of the earliest. The other ones are going to be 7, 8, 9. Has a substantial addition of 89 words at the beginning of verse 15. So it's even different than what we have in verses 9 through 20. This is described by Metzger as having an obvious, quote, obvious and pervasive apocryphal flavor, these 89 extra words, which consists of a dialogue between Jesus and his disciples concerning the ending of the period of Satan's power and the truth and righteousness now made available through Christ's death. Jerome records the same additional words and said they were found in some Greek manuscripts. Okay, so that's, that's fifth century. France moves on to a little section on literary considerations, and he writes, most of the content of the longer ending, verses 9 through 20, echoes, usually in abbreviated form, elements in the resurrection stories of Matthew, Luke, and John. And it does that as follows. And then he, he, he goes on and starts commenting about this or that. I'm going to skip to another section of France. He writes, the parts of the longer ending not accounted for in this list are those which go beyond the resurrection appearances as such to describe the subsequent preaching and activity of the church. Thus, in verse 16, we have a summary of a basic baptismal soteriology, which has the flavor of Johannine dualism and possibly draws on the baptismal element in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. In verses 17 and 18, some of the signs which are related in Acts are summarized. And verse 20 is virtually a summary of the whole book of Acts in a nutshell. In the whole of the longer ending, verses 9 through 20, the only element which is not easily accounted for on the basis of familiarity with other Gospels and the book of Acts is the emphasis in verse 18 on handling poisonous snakes and drinking poison. The former perhaps reflects the single instance of, and it was involuntary, snake handling in Acts 28, 3 through 6, but the expectation of these two activities as regular signs is the one distinctive contribution which the long ending makes. In all other respects, verses 9 through 20 have something of a second-hand flavor and look like a pastiche of elements drawn from the other Gospels and Acts. Now, that's the end of, of, you know, France's commentary there. So basically what he's saying is that in the longer ending, which does not have good textual support, everything except the snake handling and the poison 
poison you can find elsewhere in some other gospel or in the book of Acts. You can find some sort of example. And and the only two outliers are the snake handling thing and then the uh, the poison. And the snake handling thing might be an allusion to the episode in Acts 28. Again, it's not clear because the episode in Acts 28 was certainly involuntary, but it might you know be be some allusion to that. But then the the, the poison drinking has no. There, there's nothing you can find elsewhere in the New Testament for that. And and for for that you know, that reason that that this the material you have in verses nine through twenty reads like somebody else just sort of put it in there, drawing it from all these other places. In other words, it's a very secondhand kind of feel to it. That reason, plus the weak textual support, the weak manuscript support for verses nine through twenty, are the reasons why virtually all New Testament critics, textual critics, uh, do not consider verses nine through twenty as authentic. It, it's not as bad of a situation as something like First John five seven or you know part of the ending of Revelation, like with Erasmus's text and all that. But it ain't good. It's there's it has weak textual support. And I will put a link on uh, the episode page for this to a blog post that I, I found here from the Evangelical Textual Criticism blog. You know, you, you could go up to the Evangelical Textual Criticism blog like I did here and, and just put in, you know, Mark 16. And you're going to find, you know, what that group, and they are just what they sound like, Evangelical Textual Critics, what they say about um, the longer ending of Mark. And you'll find an essay by Peter Gurry. We've interviewed Peter before on this podcast. And it, it's pretty good. I recommend it. Um, just looking through it here, skimming here. Um, I, I have read this before, but in this essay, this po- this post, he quotes Dan Wallace um, because one of the arguments is that well, you know, it, the ending of Mark must have been original, and and it was lost because of the way that scrolls were rolled up, and the end of a of a you know the roll would have gotten tattered and lost, blah 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 blah. Well, Wallace is somebody who's pretty much spent a career handling these sorts of things. And he says it's extremely unlikely that Mark wrote his gospel, you know, in a particular way where this is going to be, you know, some sort of explanation. Now, I'll just, I'll read the excerpt here. This is Wallace now. However, if Mark's gospel is is earlier than this, the end of the first century, again, which is a controversy in and of itself, you know, as virtually all scholars acknowledge, regardless of their view of the synoptic problem, then he would have written his gospel on a roll, not a codex. And the first generation of copies would also have been on rolls. And if the gospel was written on a roll, then the most protected section would be the end. Because when someone rolled the book back up, the end would be on the inside, not the outside, to get tattered and stuff like that. To be sure, some lazy readers might not rewind the book when finished. Of course, they could get find a denarius at their local blockbuster, <laughs> Wallace says, for such an infraction. But the reality is this sort of thing was a rare exception, not the rule. Consequently, if Mark was originally written on a roll, it's hard to imagine how the ending could have gotten lost before copies were made. So again, Wallace is a guy that has lots of experience with scrolls, you know, the way they were wound and and, and so on and so forth. And, and, you know, you have other books as examples, too. If this if this was a common event, well, then you'd have problems with the endings of other New Testament books, too. But you don't. You know, it's just it's just this longer ending of Mark. So I'm in the camp, you know, just to wrap this up, I'm in the camp with the, you know, the textual critics, evangelical and otherwise, who just don't really see a good argument for the long ending of Mark being authentic. And so for that reason, I don't I don't feel like I have to doctrinally defend drinking poison and snake handling. because uh, that's the only place you're gonna get that stuff. And it's it's highly suspect. All right, Mike. Well, we want to remind everybody to uh, leave us a review. Uh, we're almost at 200. We got 199 reviews on iTunes, I noticed. So oh, since we just had our 200th episode, maybe we can get one more review to get uh, <laughs> 200 even. But uh, we appreciate everybody that's done so, so far. And uh, Mike, That's important. Yeah, absolutely. And Mike, we appreciate you answering our questions. And I want to thank everyone else for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless you. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. 
To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.